guys welcome to another episode of the dreams to reality podcast and today we are in Cheltenham with a very special guest mr james pope how are we doing james i am very good cam thank you very much thank you for having me last minute on this friday afternoon slash evening how has lockdown been for you james uh it's been i think like most of the rest of the country it's been a bit odd um juggling kids at home work Work from home anyway, which is nice, but working from home and having to do homeschooling, yeah, challenging to say the least. Bit of a blurry, am I at work <laughs> or am I at home? Am I dad or am I, yeah, so it's been it's been a bit up and down, but I, you know, we've been safe and well, mm. which is the main thing. Um, and a lot of people haven't been, so yeah, I just feel a bit fortunate coming out the other side of it. Surely, as a teacher, homeschooling would be easy, right? No way. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why? Uh, I think your own kids test all of the all of the tools in the toolbox in a way that other people's children just don't. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was uh, my wife and I, both teachers. That we you know, probably got uh, nearly fifty years teaching experience between us. Wow. None of it counted for anything. So, uh, if you was on holiday and you met somebody and they said to you, James, what do you do? What do you do for a living? What would you say? Uh, so Apart from being a father. Good question. Um, so I tend to put it down on documents now, sort of education consultancy. Okay. Uh, which is a bit vague. Um, so I sort of, if, if I was going to articulate it more clearly, I think I would say I've done most of my time campaigning for and supporting schools and their leaders to do senior the to leaders, do the, you mean senior head leaders, teachers. head teachers to do the job that they want to do. Okay, um, and that's uh, you know that's what that's what got me to where I am now, um, and that's what drives my passion. You know, I'm interested in change in the education system for the better. I'm interested in celebrating the education system because we've actually got a really fantastic one, but you wouldn't know it by the way we talk about it. Mm, um, interesting. That's not to say that things don't need to change because the world's changing around us. That's fascinating, actually. Yeah, um, but I think we spend a lot of time beating ourselves up. Um, and I don't think we spend enough time appreciating the education system that we've got and okay. the great work that happens in it on a daily basis. I want to touch on that. Right? I'm sure we're going to dive into some, not weaknesses, but some areas what need to improve. Just because I haven't really heard a teacher say that before. Okay. Which is interesting, really. Yeah. So what are some of the strengths of the educational system within the UK? So I think... If you, if you break it down, if you look at it at a sort of granular level, the vast majority of our children go to school every single day and they have access to really high quality, highly trained, very skilled teachers. Okay. And they have really good lessons and the vast majority of them enjoy the work that they're doing. Okay. <laughs> so I think if you, look at it, if you look at it at that very sort of granular level, you know, it's, we do a really good job. But we've become obsessed with the improvement agenda. Mm. Um, and, and I suppose part of the work that I do, certainly with the Heads Up Network, but also with the whole education network, is, okay, let's look at what we're doing and what's good about what we're doing and build on that. Yeah. Because actually what we spend, what we don't do is we don't celebrate that enough. It never happens. And I talk mm. to, when I talk to heads, I talk to, you know, okay, results day, what were your results like? They're Okay. Okay, what, what were they? And, you know, you sort of break that down. You go, okay, well, 70% of the children in your school got the results they should have done. That's yeah. amazing. 
Okay, yes, yeah. you need to focus on the other 30%, and that's where you've turned your mind immediately. But actually, what about all of those kids who had a great time and got the results mm. they should have got? And um, who had a positive experience within school as well. Yeah, and of course, it's not just all about the outcomes. You know, the other thing, we've become obsessed about outcomes. Mm. It's actually all about, and as I, as I talk to the Heads Up Network, it's all about those little inspirational moments that happen every single day okay. in every single school in this country and we're in danger of becoming so obsessed with the end of the journey that we forget the journey. Is it because you can't measure that? <laughs> yeah. Everybody just is fascinated with measuring, does it work? Yeah. How do you know it works? Yeah, totally. It's become, it's become all about assessment, outcomes, and actually not even outcomes, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the palaver of this summer, you know, not even outcomes that are owned by children, outcomes that are used to judge how schools have done well actually that's not what they're about they're the outcomes that the children have got mm. and have worked hard for and should be celebrated mm. but because we use it also to measure the performance of the school it's taken on and indeed our education system it's taken on you know another layer i'm not saying that's not important but the danger is we forget that actually they're about an assessment of all of the learning that that child has done and they're not the only thing that you can use to assess what that child's done. Yeah. That child has had a 16 to 18 year life and they've had a 14, 15 year experience in our schools. Mm. And we distill it down to eight grades on a piece of paper at the age of 16. What about everything else? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's what I do. And I, I, one thing which is apparent with you um, is actually your passion and actually how much you genuinely care. I think that really shows through. Where did this come from? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, how long have you been teaching for? Uh, I started, uh, I'm an, I'll describe myself as an accidental teacher, but a deliberate leader. So I fell, <laughs> I fell into teaching in 1997. So part, part of my passion comes from my own experience. So I went to a really good school in the 1980s, but I'm you know, I was fairly typical, reasonably bright, but not particularly motivated young boy. Okay. Um, could get by without doing an awful lot of work. Um, you know, that, that was my experience. And at that point in the 80s, and certainly from my family background, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of council, council house raised in, in Bromsgrove, grew up in Worcester, um, first generation university attendee in, in my family. Um, you know, really supportive parents, really supportive family. They wanted the best for me from education. But I didn't, I didn't understand where that came from and I didn't really understand what they were talking about. I still remember to this day them coming home from a, uh, what was then uh, year three, third year, uh, year nine as it would be mm. now, parents' evening. You know, Raver, your teacher says you should do this and you should do this and you should go to university. And I was like, okay, yeah. great, sounds great. Didn't have a clue what university was. Of course. So same, you know, somebody said to you, go to university. Yeah, same thing. Okay, me. that sounds amazing. What is it? Yeah, of course. Um, and at that, you know, at that point, there just wasn't that input of advice and guidance. So I kind of just drifted through. Did end, end up at university. I took a couple of years out at the end of my A-levels. Did get to university in the end. Went to Liverpool. Um, did a four-year course. It was very research. I was applied biologist. It was very research-based. And that was probably the first time I'd probably ended up doing something that I was passionate about. Okay. I really, I was doing it for me rather than for other people. Yeah. So that sort of idea of intrinsic motivation. I was intrinsically motivated to do well on that degree course. Got two mm. one. Really pleased. Came out of university. I did a because it was a it was a sandwich course. I did a year of research. Okay. In uh, the middle. Which I thought yeah middle? third year which I thought I'd really like, and really hated. You know, I just, I just, it was just the dullest thing. Some people love it for me. It just yeah, wasn't for me. Um, so that, that has sort of knocked any sort of research career on the head. Uh, so I came out of university. I moved down to uh, Cheltenham. Um, didn't really know what to do. Ended up working in a car breaker's yard, Twigworths, oh, wow. over near Gloucester. Yeah, yeah. Did two years there. Absolutely loved it. About halfway through that period of time, I thought probably not the best use of a 2-1 in applied biology. No, of course. So, okay, classics, what shall I do? I'll give teaching a go. Okay. And then the moment I stepped into the classroom, just loved it. Mm. Absolutely loved it. It was, you know, um, in a way that I hadn't thought I would, actually. It was just that interaction with young people, 
helping them to understand something and learn something just really fired something in me that hadn't mm. been there before. Um, and I just, yeah, really enjoyed it. And I was at, I was at Clee School, which is fairly local to here. It, large, successful comp, loads of opportunities to experience different stuff. So, um, you know, d- did some uh, pastoral leadership. I was ahead a year for a bit. I really enjoyed that. I loved the pastoral work in schools, um, but also did subject leadership. Um, yeah, so, so so that's where I come from. Let's fast forward a little bit. When was your first headship? First headship was uh, I got my first headship in April 2014. I was interviewed, successful for the job. Uh, started in September 2014, Marwood School in Marwood. South Gloucestershire. Okay, yeah, first headship. First headship. Yeah. So, how was your experience at Marwood? Mike, so I loved I loved being a head teacher, and I loved that school. Um, it was it was a tricky time, uh, and we we can touch on that in a bit more detail. Yeah. I think it was it was quite challenging as a first headship, um, <laughs> but I I'd wanted to be ahead for about that by that stage I'd wanted to be ahead for about five six years. Okay, actually probably longer than that. Probably I'd wanted to be ahead for about a decade. First started thinking about headship in about two thousand and four, um, and I'd been working towards being ahead because I wanted to. I felt really passionate about, I'd been fortunate to work for a really good head teacher myself at Cleef. Um, and, you know, I wanted to run my own school and have a vision and a strategy mm. and a view of education. We sort of unpicked, you know, it was partly, partly formed in my own experience, but a high quality education for all children. Yeah. Um, yeah. So first headship, loved it. It was really challenging. Uh, there were bits of it that, you know, I look back, even now I look back on, it sort of feels like a vague memory, but, you know, the first year we had to save, immediately arriving in September, um, the books that had appeared to have been balanced the previous April weren't balanced. Mm. So in that first, in year, we had to save about £600,000 in the first year. Wow, so you're, you're going into headship, yeah. right, with this feeling inspired, feeling motivated to get everything you've got to build a school of how you want it to look. Yeah. But then all of a sudden you, you get your headship, you go into a school and then you realize, actually, I'm not really being a teacher here. I'm not really following my vision because now I'm stuck in the books and stuck in the business side of running the school. Yeah, I think... Um, Surely that must have been quite difficult because you're probably ready to go. But then all of a sudden you went in and there was a massive yeah. hurdle you had to overcome. Yeah, it was. But I think, you know, head teachers up and down the country will describe different hurdles that they have to overcome. Okay. It was a hurdle. And you don't go into headship without, you know, without um, being aware that there will be challenges along the way. Was you aware of that particular no, challenge? I was, quite, I was not aware. Was of that. Was you particular. supposed to be aware of it? Uh, well, you on an interview process, you know, you do the best due diligence you can around. Okay. Um, you know, and I'd say the books, the books were balanced in the April. Um, that unpicking that a little bit in the September and October of that first year, it became apparent that that wasn't the case. Mm. Uh, so that. That was a surprise uh, to me. I think it was slightly surprising to the governors. Mm. Um, you know, but we but we dealt with it. And I, I think the point about the, the the vision and the strategies really, you know, is a really important point because actually you have to deal with that, but actually you also have to keep your eye on that. Mm. You know, actually where are we going? Um, and first headship. So you know, you put the hours in, you put the time in, and you make that happen. And actually, in that first year we made a lot happen at that school. You know, we changed an awful lot of what we were doing. We September saved the money 2014. Through to, through to the following year. Um, what we didn't get at the end of that first year and, and was a, a sticking point well, for us, although the, the results were good, so the attainment of the children was good, where we struggled was with the progress, so getting children to move far enough from their Key Stage 2 experience Got through to you. their Key Stage 4. Um, and that became... We knew that was an issue. Um, it became more of an issue later on, um, although perhaps not the issue, not as big an issue as was presented, mm. because there were some very specific reasons why that we had we had five brilliant primary schools, yeah, um, who were our main feeder primary schools, and, and the reality is they got really good results by their children mm. due to the fantastic work they were doing, and what that meant was we needed to get our children to be getting A stars and A's mm. when they were getting A's and B's, yeah. Um, and, the, and the issue was for us that, and so a lot of the stuff that we were doing off to, to deal with that was cultural. We said, don't just be satisfied with A's and B's, aim for A's and A stars, but that takes time. 
you know, to, to change the culture of those children who were brilliant. The kids, the kids at Marwood are really fantastic, but you know, the reality is, how much of that long... culture comes down to expectation, um, but positive expectation in a way. Yeah, but it, it, it's about. I think it's about the realization that somebody believes in you. Okay. I think it's about it's about the realization that you can believe in yourself. Yeah. Um, I think it's about getting agency and ownership in your learning. These are the things that I feel really passionately about. That you know that part of the vision of what we were trying to do. You know, children who owned their learning felt responsible for it, and that was you know that was a big culture shift. You know, when we when I arrived there in the September, some work had been done by the CEO of the trusts in the six months previously, Melanie Warns. As she was the CEO at that point. But the reality is that, you know, there did need to be a big cultural shift at that school. Mm. And that was recognised by the staff. And one of the reasons why I took the job, it was really clear that that was recognised by the staff, that things needed to change. You know, so it's had quite to, exciting, really. Yeah, really, really exciting. exciting. The staff were on board, you know, the community on board. And over that first year, you know, the kids really came on board. Um, and, and we were starting to see some real shifts in, mm. you know, behaviour. And I don't just mean behaviour. I mean just, you know, the, the way that the children were their around the school. Their, their attitude to learning, their, all of that, yeah. The way they open their minds and stuff. Yeah. Amazing, right? So let's dive, let's like dive into it. The BBC. For everybody who doesn't know, you were part <laughs> of a TV programme for the BBC. Yeah. Um, which, for me... Even just having a camera following me around twenty four seven, with me not having complete control of it, yeah, it's quite nerve wracking. Even yeah. though I'm comfortable with what I know and I know what I can deliver, I mean that takes a huge amount of courage. Yeah, I mean yeah, we got Gadget Line Dave here. I also have a few other people who come with me, but I'm in control of it. Yeah, right. So, when was the idea that BBC was going to come to your school? Was you excited about it or was it just we a normal were, day? We were, we were cautious. So I think the first, the first time that it was raised was, I think it was probably in the sort of February, March of 2017. And it was a, it was a trust level conversation. It was a, much. So you've been ahead for what, two, two and a half two, years? Two and a bit years, point? yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, I think I think we were we were cautious, and so we met with the production. So basically, the production company had made Hospital, which was another BBC Two program. Okay, had huge success with it, and they were looking to see whether they could. You know, it it was very it was aimed to be quite a thoughtful program in the right. same way that it was with Hospital, to sort of get people thinking. Okay, you know, what do we demand from our NHS? What do we what do we look for from it? And then they were looking to do the same thing with school. Okay, actually, let's let's get under the skin of it. So this. And so when we first met to discuss it, certainly as head teachers, we were, you know, there, there was a place for the type of program, you know, the sort of educating series. And that's great. Anybody who's made those. Um, but it, actually, we, you know, we felt that had been done and we weren't looking to do that. So that kind of fixed cameras all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, and, and sort of capturing children in that, in that way. We weren't, that's not what we were looking to do. There was a real... I suppose there was a moral imperative in what we were doing because actually, you know, I think a few of us felt we've got an education system that we're constantly pillaring and and uh, and bashing with without actually anybody really understanding the detail of what head teachers and schools are dealing with. Mm. Um, that was compounded by the fact that you know South Gloucestershire was one of the lowest funded local authorities in the country. So we were having to do all of that with very little money, improve the education. Um, it was compounded further by the fact that um, the fair funding formula, which we'd been waiting on to help us get better funding for our children and yeah. our schools, uh, when that when that formula was uh, when that formula came out, we actually dropped to the bottom of the funding tables wow. rather than going up. Um, and it was so it was partly driven by this actually. One of our taglines was, everybody's been to school, so everybody has a view of what schools are like. And what we want to do is go, come and have a look at what schools in, you know, 2017 in Great Britain are actually like. We are fairly representative as a trust of schools. Yeah. And so that, that was the drive for the program. So we sort of sat there. We then met with the production company. We talked a lot through the style of the program. Um, yeah. So actually the filming, you know, they're not there all the time. Um, there's a there's a lot of filming to start with, and then as the sort of golden threads of the story start to emerge, yeah, um, you know there are very particular bits that they're looking to film. I was really fortunate; I had a great 
you know, the director who was based at Marwood was, you know, really fantastic. Um, and, you know, the, the story at Marwood sort of told itself because we, you know, we signed the papers to, to make the TV programme, the story for Marwood's and, you know, the, the, and the other schools in the Trust as well, but from Marwood's perspective, the story was no money, uh, shrinking demographic, student numbers are falling, having to save ridiculous amounts of money every year, and yet the community... The children, the parents, you know, the said teachers come in deliver, delivering this vision and this strategy for the school and, and things are on the up. Signed the papers for the TV programme. Two weeks later, Ofsted came and put us in special measures. Oh. Uh, and so, the, you know, the, the programme then took on a different flavour. Um, and, you know, it captured that year of being a school with no money in special measures. Um, and I always say to the parents, you know, who were just unbelievably supportive through that very challenging, what was my last year as head there? Um, I said to the parent, you know, this, you know, what, what does, what does, what does special measures mean? Does it mean we'll get more money? Wow, it's like, okay. no, <laughs> it doesn't mean you get more money. You just get more scrutiny. And our biggest problem was we still had to save another nine hundred thousand pounds that final year, um, which we did. You know, so we saved the money. Um, and at that point, my feeling was, you know, a whole, a whole collision of things. I mean, it had taken its toll physically and mentally. Uh, absolutely no doubt about that at all. Um, so how did it impact the school and the community? Not only when you went into special measures, but also when a camera was stuck in your face, right? Because surely if you're a young teenager and there's cameras about, you don't think really was, think about consequences or, yeah, or I, repercussions of actions. You just... You play to the camera sometimes. Yeah. And obviously, you know, it's an edited TV programme. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, okay. Uh, it's, I mean, there's a couple of points about that. I think the first one is there's absolutely no doubt that, that there, was a, there was a mix in reaction from the children. And there were two factors. There was the TV programme and the special measures. Yeah. Uh. Um, you know, I've, I've got absolutely no doubt, you know... Almost um, perfect timing for BBC, wasn't it? It was perfect timing. <laughs> but, you know, from, I think from my point of view, you know, the, the Ofsted impact was far, far greater. The TV cameras captured yeah, I got you. some of that. Um, and, you know, I think, as I said earlier on, I had a six-week period after, after we'd gone public with the outcome to the children. And I will still... I still can hear... Um, the audible gasp. So we gathered to tell the children that we've gone to special measures. We gathered them all into the sports hall, um, and I'm stood in front of uh, all of the children at Marwood School, sat in perfect uniform, and on the way to the sports hall, been listening to them chattering. Can you get the offset outcome? Do you think we got mm. good? Yeah. Do you think that's what the outcome was? Um, <laughs> and and knowing obviously in here that that's not the outcome, that mm. wasn't the outcome. Um, and then I'm just standing in front of them and tell them, and I can still hear the audible gasp from the children when we told them we'd gone to special measures because they were expecting us to say we got good. Because oh. for them, the school had done nothing but improve in the time that they'd been there. They knew the financial context. They knew we'd have to make loads of savings. Which is, which is and I, I have to back you up, James, because at the same time, I, I've never met you before, but I went to Marwood around that time. Um, 2016, 2017. And in my career now, I've spoken hundreds of schools. And I can still tell, just by walking in, not always, but a lot of the time, what is a good school and what's not. And the culture, the culture you're talking about. And I have to give credit to you is that I never experienced any of these things which is portrayed about Marwood. And I'm yeah. not saying it, for, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it, trust <laughs> me. And That's nice of you to say. No, but it's true because yeah. I remember actually, because at this point I remember um, one of your members of staff booked me in for a two-hour session with the whole of year eight. And in earlier in my career at that point, I would take anything, right? Yeah. Now I look back and think, okay, how could I do it different with my experience? I would have executed it it's slightly different. But I had two hours in a, in a like drama hall um, with the whole of year eight. It was cramped. It was hot. And the behavior was fantastic. The, the members of staff was fantastic. Yeah. The staff was going around working in the groups on yeah, the yeah. tables as well. And sometimes there's nothing worse when I go into a school with a big group and working for a couple of hours and staff are just all sat on the side. 
I'm like, well, actually, if you guys get in, ask some questions as well, it would make it a lot more impactful. And I have to say, um, to say that you was in special measures at that time, and to be honest, um, I didn't know much about the BBC programme. I heard about it, but I never looked into it, only until I knew I was having this interview. And I was shocked to hear mm. that you was in special measures. Yeah. I'm shocked to hear it, and especially with the fact that I was there around that time. I've always known about the, the funding kind of and the money crisis in South Gloucestershire schools. So... That's an interesting dynamic and things to talk about. But the fact that you went into special measures and everybody thought you went into good, surely that's a massive cultural kick. Yeah. Um, and it was. It was It was an absolute shocker. And you know, as I said earlier on, I had an officer two weeks prior to that at a primary school and we'd... You know, that primary school had come out of special measures for the first time in a very long time. So you was feeling good, you was so feeling was, positive. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking, actually, you know, we've only been working in the primary school for eight months. Actually, I've been here for three years. Ah. And uh, don't get me wrong, you know, we were self-evaluating at requiring improvement. We didn't think we were good. The kids did, because for mm. the kids, the journey had been... You know, That's interesting. Um, you know, but from our point of view... Um, it's, I'm a not, ju- it's a journey, it's right? A journey. Surely. It's a Yeah, cultural shift is a journey. And I'm not stupid. There were things that needed to be better. Um, but actually, you know, I think on the balance of probabilities for us to have gone into special measures, um, I think that's highly questionable. And, um, and that, you know, of course, I'm, I was the head, I would say that. But Not know, when I, you actually said, okay, we may not have been good. Yeah, we, we may have required we improvement fools. and there were still areas of yeah. weakness. I think for you... It would be easy to say, no, it was all a shambles. We shouldn't have done this. We was a good school. It would be easy, but you're not. So, but then also, I don't know too much about the Ofsted uh, process. I, I don't, I don't want to dive into Ofsted too much. But also the timing, if there has been a gradual improvement in the school and also financially and they understand the full picture of the school... And actually, do you know what? Understanding that if this school is making progress, even if it's slow, and then you chuck in a special measures... Yeah, that is gonna. Is, what's the word? Demoralize? Gonna, yeah, it's gonna. It was. It was. It was a huge blow to the whole community. Um, and I think. How can you get motivated after that? Well, you know, that's part. I suppose part of the job of the head in that situation is then to try and get people back motivated mm. again. It was. A, it was a blow to staff. It was a blow to parents. It was a blow to children. I don't think anybody really believed it, and that actually creates its own problem because you're sort of like, well, actually, that's what we now got. So. We've got to we've got to crack on with it, and we've got to address yeah. the issues. I think for me as the head, um, you know, you get you you get sucked into. And this is partly financial, but it was also partly due to the Ofsted. But you know, the things that you've done that perhaps are slightly different, and and are part of your vision and your strategy yeah. and the way that you think a school should be run. You know, your license and permission as a head teacher of a school in special measures to do those things gets curtailed. Um, and I think, you know, that was that was certainly my experience over that next 12 months was, you know, still having to save massive amounts of money uh, when there wasn't any around and sort of reaching a point of sort of thinking, well, actually, I'm, I'm not delivering my vision or my strategy anymore. You know, I've, I've had to I've had to compromise on, you know, lots because of the finances, but you can you yeah. can work around that. But actually, I'm now having to compromise not just on a financial front, but I'm also having to compromise on an educational front. Because, would you say it's safe to say you went into survival mode? Yeah, very, very possibly. I think... Um, whilst getting filmed? Yeah. I, I, I don't think even just whilst getting filmed. I think... I mean, it is, the TV programme is interesting. I mean, I do say when I do, when I do um, conference speaking, <laughs> I do say, actually, you know, you'd, you'd watch the two hours of the TV programme and think I never smiled all year. Yeah. Uh, actually, I did a lot. There were still a lot of laughs. There was still a lot of joy. I still actually enjoyed bits of that last year. But it had become, it wasn't the job. It wasn't headship as I perceived headship as being anymore. And for me, that was actually, am I enjoying it? No, I'm not. Do I love this school and this community? Yes. You know, when I did my resignation, I think I said, four kids, you know, Ma would always felt like my fifth baby. Um, and to have to give that up was really tough. Um, but actually just reaching a point where thinking it needs somebody new with new energy who's going who's gonna to pick this up and run with it in a different way. And it just happened to be, it was very fortunate that um, Del Planter, who was a deputy head in the trust at another secondary school in the trust, came across to join my senior leadership team. 
Dale wanted to be a head teacher, uh, wanted to work with me. I wanted to work with him. So he came and joined the senior leadership team at Marwood. Um, uh, at, at the point at which he joined was the point at which I started thinking, actually, Dale might be the person who's got the energy to take this mm-hmm. on. Um, and the right set of skills to move it on, so and so and what he, made, what and he made did. you want to resign? Which what bit in particular was there? A kind of just actually, do you know what? I think I think this ain't good for my mental, my physical, yeah, my family. Yeah, it was all of that. I mean, I called my I called one of my conference presentations. Where's your head at? Did you? I'm sorry. Did you resign on the program, or did you? They captured it? they captured me announcing the resignation to the staff on the TV program. Uh, which was a bit I was torn about at the time but actually they, I think they filmed it in quite which they had done a lot of the stuff they filmed it in quite a sensitive way so I'd agreed with the uh, CEO Will Roberts I'd agreed that I would leave at the end of that academic year but I suppose it, it, for me it had really I think it was February time it was after the first monitoring visit at the end of January which had gone really well um, and I was well, this, part, this part of my basically my conf, my conference presentation called where's your head at so I'm driving to work one day I'm listening to the radio basement jacks where's your head at you know thumping tune <laughs> um, uh, and I was driving and I was thinking actually where is my head at um, am I enjoying this anymore is this what I thought it would be you know so from that period forward there was just this sort of um, not emptiness is probably too strong but you know the, the mental tiredness the physical exhaustion um, the, the lack of feeling as if it was my project anymore. It didn't feel like my headship anymore. So did you feel guilty? In resigning, uh, I wouldn't have resigned if Dell hadn't come. So I didn't feel guilty because I knew Dell was the right person to carry it on. That's quite good to know. Um, and, you know, that was, that was part of the decision-making. I kind of thought, actually, okay, I know he's coming in. I know he, you know, he... He is, he's a head teacher in waiting. He's got all of the skills, all of the attributes. Um, you know, he was coming across to work with me, which was, which was fantastic. And I say he wanted, he wanted to work with me, which was really flattering. Um, and it just, you know, that and a whole series of other things, it just felt like the right timing. Um, and I think from a, you know, from a personal, from a mental health point of view, it was absolutely the right timing. Because I think I would have stayed and done another year I'm not quite sure what state I would have been at the end of that second wow. year. Um, and, you know, my wife, my wife, well, my family generally, but, you know, people, they were worried about me. You mm. know, you go, you awake in the middle of the night. You're were up you at, worried about how you was going to be perceived on the show? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I hadn't really thought, if I'm honest, I hadn't really thought about it. My mind was kind of elsewhere, focused on the school. Um and I watched the I watched the first so I'd, I'd resigned, mm. um, and you know that that had been a a big decision, but b a sort of enormous relief, mm. and which it often is for so many heads that I talk to once you've made really? that decision. Yeah. Um, and so it was you know it was July time, and I watched the first sort of rough edit of the TV program, um, which is very hard to watch without crying, which I did a lot, um, and. You know, I think the production company, they were really happy with the two Marwood episodes. Can you remember when you watched it back, can you remember those particular times or was it just all a blur? And you're just like... Yeah, no, totally remember each of the incidents, yeah, yeah. That each of the things that happened during the programme. I mean, I think I think the worst, the, the, the one that really struck home and I think struck home for a lot of people was when Will, I was, we were looking at, the, I was looking at the budget with Will, so I was in his office um, and... You know, there's there's two or three bits. Of, I mean, I didn't watch it when it went out because I couldn't watch it again. Um, but there's there's two or three bits that really stick in the in my head. It was the bit where we were looking at the figures for the children joining in September, the following year, and after working so hard to get those numbers up, they then dipped again because of the special mm-hmm. measures, and that was a real blow because it was a blow for what we'd done in the community, but it was a blow from a financial point of view as well. And there was, there was a bit where basically I, I was talking to my, my middle leaders who were just brilliant, all of them. Um, but, a, you know, really contentious issue about timetables and non-contact time. Um, and that was, you know, that was really hard. Um, and watching that back was really tough. Mm. And that was, the, you know, the one point in that year, you know, in a, in a year of very, very difficult circumstances and conversations and decision making 
you know, that was the one point in, in the year that I, I vividly remember, but I also remember turning around to Tim, the director, and going, you know, please leave um, at the end of that meeting. Because mm. um, he asked if you're all right, and I, I wasn't. Mm. I wasn't all right at all. Um, you know, the middle leaders were defending so their ground. So brave, though, I think, of you just to have the courage and to be open. And um, we, we quickly move on to after, but just out of curiosity, how accurate was that TV show of that time? Um, I think I think in terms of... So, we, you know, we set out to show what schools are actually like. Mm. That wasn't the narrative for Marwood. The narrative for Marwood was going to be a financial one. Yeah. Uh, it ended up being a... This is the damage that Ofsted can do one. Okay. Um, and, you know, that that wasn't the story they were telling. It, it, it was, certainly wasn't my intention when we signed the papers that I would be resigning 12 months later. Wow. Um, you know, so that wasn't the story that we set out to tell. But, you know, the, we set out to show people what schools are actually dealing with. You know, and one of the things I used to talk to my parent community a lot about was, you know, we, we want the best from all of our public services. We want the best education. We want the best police force. We want the best... Uh, NHS that we can possibly get, but there is a there is a there is a reckoning to be done about how much tax we're prepared to pay mm. and how much we demand from our yeah of course from our public services, and that was you know one of the messages from you know of the TV program was you know we can't expect our public school system you know our state school system to be a replica of our private school system when the funding gap is absolutely astronomical. Uh, and we can't, I used to say this to the parents, you know, we can't demand a Rolls Royce of education service if we're funding it at a Robin Reliant level. It's just not possible to balance those two <laughs> things. Um, and, and so therefore, you've got to make tough decisions. There is within that, there is, you know, there is something to be challenged, which is why do some areas of the country get more money than others? You know, with the possible exception of central London and the outer ring of London, actually, the reality is the cost of education is the same all over the country. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, most of the cost is teachers. Teacher salaries, except for the for the London waiting, teacher salaries are the same up and down the country. Yeah. Um, and, that, you know, that, that is a question to be asked. And that, that was part of what we were trying to do with the TV programme. So did we achieve what we set out with the TV programme to create a debate around education? I think so. It was pretty short-lived, mm. um, which was disappointing. Um you know, but hopefully it How created... How you perceived as an individual, as a leader and as a head? <laughs> well, that's what you worry about. So actually, I hadn't really thought about it, come back to your earlier question. Yeah. Um, but you do, you know, the closer... I'd, obviously, I'd finished. So it was. It came out in the November. I'd, I'd finished in, in the end of August. My contract ended. I hadn't immediately done anything else. Um, I'd set up my business, but I hadn't actually actively gone out and done yeah. anything. And as it got nearer to the launch of the program, I remember becoming more conscious of, you know, people are going to watch this and they're... They might turn around and think you're a tit, mm. um, idiot. What a what a wally! Um, and you do start to have those thoughts because you know you self self reflection. You're thinking, oh, Lord. yeah, of course, it's natural. It's human natural nature. to natural to do that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, it was interesting. And actually, I, I couldn't watch it. But so I I sat in one room. My wife watched it in another because oh, she'd really? not seen them yet. I couldn't watch it. I said, I'd, look, I just can't you watch it watch, again. You'd be watching her watching it. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't watch it, so I didn't. Um, and I texted uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, the other head teachers in the trust, uh, Angie and David. I said, look, I'm not even going to go on social media to, until you let me give me a flavour of what the tone's like. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, one of the outcomes of it was, as you know, I said earlier on, and that led to the work that I now do with Heads Up, a lot of people watched them. Some, I'm sure some people thought, oh, they, well, I could have sorted that school out in no time at yeah, all. That's what actually, I'm... an awful lot of people watched it and thought, that's my experience. And actually, you know, there's somebody who's trying to do the best they can in ridiculously challenging circumstances. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I look back on it, would I have done things differently? Could I have done things differently? Yeah, I'm sure I could have done. Um, would I? Knowing, sure. knowing what you know now, yeah. If there was one thing you could have done different, just one thing which could have made maybe not a different outcome. Maybe it's the way you behaved, the way you acted, maybe not get so stressed. I don't know. <laughs> just looking back, where you would have made a different decision. If there was one decision or one thing you could have changed looking back now, what would it have been? 
Um, or what was? It's a, re- it's, a, it's a really good question. Or let me. Or one one of your biggest lessons from that, what you can now pass on to other head teachers. Yeah. So I think um, I think the, the in in terms of in terms of values led leadership and and passion for doing something different in education, I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed a thing. Um, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Actually, the obvious thing to change would have been to have played the Ofsted game from day one. Okay. So to focus only on year 11 outcomes, to get those year 11 outcomes to a point, the, the progress outcomes, to do nothing else in the school and just to have focused on that end point mm-hmm. with nothing. And we worked hard on that. We had a whole, you know, had a whole um, SLT member who was focused on that. Yeah. But basically just thrown all of the energy from the whole SLT team into that one thing. Um, and arguably, if we'd got really good progress results, we wouldn't have got that Ofsted. And then I would have had the space to do, you know, something different and creative and blah, blah, okay, blah, blah. got you. So the, that could be a point of reflection. Kind However, of play play in the game to change the game type of thing. Yeah. However, my argument is, we shouldn't have to do that. No. I shouldn't have to play the game by an Ofsted team's rules and interpretation of a framework mm. in order to do the stuff that I think is the right thing for that community. Yeah. And that that's arguable. You know, there are there are different ways of looking at that. And I accept there are different ways of looking at that. But I suppose you looking back, yeah, I could have done that differently. I think my piece of advice would be, and it's sad that this is my piece of advice, but you know, it's a piece of work that we're doing with the Heads Up community, is pick your school really carefully in your first headship. Um and and I think that's one of the biggest issues in our education what you system. Say it's sad that that's a, a bit of advice. Yeah. Wow. It's, I th- well, it's horrible. But you know the the reality. You, you can't is, be that honest, James. You're not allowed to be. No, but <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is what we we've got an accountability system which is which is portraying schools in a certain way. Um. It does so without taking context into account. So we've got schools across the country who have been, you know, RI or special measures for a very long period of time. The context is not taken into account. We send head teachers into those schools. Head teachers willingly go into those schools, and I take my hat off to every single one of them. But then we bash them over the head with a very large stick, and we scapegoat them. Uh, you know, there is a school not a million miles away from here, which I think is on its tenth head teacher in eight you. years. Yeah. The, the, and that so school's that, so, had some bloody good head teachers. And that school has had some some head teachers who have turned up with a huge reputation. Yeah. And they've lost that reputation off the back of being head at that school. And you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. So so one of my arguments is even when you was talking about it, yeah. I w- yeah. And I, I think we've got, we've got to question the thinking that's going on here, where we're we're looking at schools that have got very particular issues, very particular contexts. They need a much broader strategic view of how we're going to improve them. Mm. They need time. They need time. Yeah. They need a collective wisdom and a collective effort. But we're still in this cycle of thinking, we'll just recruit a great head teacher. Yeah. They'll change everything. Yeah. The school will turn around and we keep making the same mistake. And the victims in that process are head teachers. It's it's career ending, and so I, I'm it, dealing with lots so, of heads for whom it has been career ending. So if it is career ending, firstly, let, let's say this: the experience you went through, I think that would have won. I think for a lot of people, that would have been career ending. Would you agree? Not only being on TV, but also, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I kind of had offers afterwards. For headship, um, you know, but, know. you know, which is which is great. I think that at the time, if if you were a head, and I'm, you know, I've spoken to hundreds of head teachers in the last 18, 18 months, but if you're a head who's been in that position, it feels like it's career ending. It isn't so it necessarily. Is surely, what? Surely, it was a huge knock, knock to your confidence. Sir. Yeah, completely. Not just you, but also the other heads you work with. Yeah. Surely it is a big knock to your confidence, your competence. Everything yeah. you've known, everything you've worked towards, everything you've trained, 
surely, yeah, there must a big knock to the confidence, but also you talk about career ending. So that means these individuals will now leave education when really they've been working 15 years to get into that position. So really they are still qualified, they are still experienced, they are still the best person for the job, but all of a sudden all this money, resources, what's gone into that person, gone. Yeah. Education's lost another good one. Yeah. At a time How when, common a, is that? It's, it's happening a lot, up and down the country. And, you know, part of the work that we're doing with Heads Up is to, is to highlight it and shine a spotlight on it and go, hang on, this is a bit bonkers. We've got, we've got recruitment and retention crisis in headship. Mm. We, you know, we're, we're struggling to fill a lot of heads positions. Really? Um, there are some schools who find it really, really difficult to recruit a head, the ones that we described earlier on. Mm. Um, and yet we've got the situation where, where somebody does step into that position and take that job on, they're bashed over the head and to the point at which yeah. they're then, you know, I wrote a blog piece about 18 months ago and called it the bonfire of the head teachers. Mm. You know, throw them on the, throw them on the scrap heap, throw them on the bonfire, you're done. Yeah, I don't care what your reputation was like before you turned up here. You've had 18 months to sort this school out and, and you've you not done it. Yeah. It's, it's short-sighted. Uh. It's wasteful. Emotionally incredibly damaging. You ask the question, does, it take, does your confidence take it? Yeah, of course it does. I spent, I, spent, I spent two months, this is going to sound really dramatic, I don't mean to, I spent two months repairing myself physically and mentally. <laughs> I did nothing for two months. Yeah, I exercised wow. every day. You know, CrossFit session, ran, picked the kids up from school. I didn't think about education for two months. It took me two months of doing that just to put myself back together. But I still, this conversation, I'm still dealing with the emotional fallout of that. Where are we now? Two years later? Three years later? That's why I don't want to... Well, I say I don't want to talk about it. We've spoken about it. But I've, I think the angle why I want to talk about it is because I feel like what you're doing now is incredible and the courage and the strength it takes for you to step outside of this comfort zone and do the work you are doing and fully being passionate about it because do you know what? Okay, you might not be working within a school now. However your impact on all these different head teachers are impacting the teenagers. And I care about the teenagers, yeah, right? And it, yeah. it, it is so, so important. And a re- and the kind of, they call it what, a football manager yeah, thing. Yeah. And the school, what we've been talking about, it's not about just going in and excluding all the naughty kids because I know that community very, very well. And sometimes, even if it takes longer than 18 months, they just want to see the similar face within the school. Yeah. Because it's the community which is suffering, and it's like it, you, you can't keep having a, a different role model in yeah. or a different leader in place because you're going to be like, what? What does this yeah. even mean? Well, Einstein's definition of madness: keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. There you go. And actually, you know, when are we going to take? When are we going to start taking a much more, a, a much longer term view of what some of these? And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not painting Marwood in that. That Marwood who was a very different community. Mm. But we had this really significant financial context, you know, three million pounds in three years, wow. save all of that money and, and make the education go like that. And actually we did make the education go like that, but apparently it wasn't quick enough. Um, but I think, you know, the, the emotional toll on heads, and it's really nice of you to, to, to praise the work with head teachers, you know, but I was really fortunate I had a TV program, you know, that's it's a significant amount of PR is to have two hours of, and, and mm. with the reaction that I got, you know, that I'm, I was invited to do Head Teachers Roundtable Conference the following March to do the keynote speech at that conference. And, and I remember, and by then, a significant number of heads had got in touch with me and said, couldn't watch it, that was me. Um, I'm going through something similar. I've been through something similar. Um, so I'd had a lot of those sorts of conversations. So when I did the keynote speech for Head Teachers Roundtable, you know, I stood, I said, you know, the, the only reason I'm stood here is because I was on television. Um, if I wasn't on television, I'd probably still be sat actually in this kitchen. Mm. And, you know, I made that point because the reality is this is happening a lot. Yeah, different, yeah. and, and I said, you know, I'm here representing 200 odd head teachers stood behind me who didn't have a TV program made about them and actually are hiding away somewhere, damaged, impacted by a system which seems obsessed 
with crushing them. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not, we've got 33,000 head teachers in this country. I'm not, I'm not making a bigger issue of it is than it is. There's an awful lot of them are really successful, yeah, yeah, have great that. careers, but there is a not insignificant number of them who are being treated appallingly. And I don't think that's on. Mm. So, talking about a lack of your confidence being knocked, was you ever criticised for that programme? Was there anybody, I don't want to know names, but was there anyone who said, how can he start this thing up for head teachers? What does he know he failed as a head teacher? Playing devil's advocate here, the, the, because I've been, on, <laughs> I've been on Twitter, not for you, um, but in general, and I, I see how actually quite negative... Yeah. the educational system can be of each other and sometimes I think wow if, you're, if your students in your school acted the way you've been acting on Twitter yeah, yeah. They, they'd probably get a few detentions yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you ever experienced any of that or was it I, all- actually I, I haven't and, and there, there were I, look, I, I didn't spend a lot of time looking for it which um, is a good cause, thing because as I said, I said earlier on it's a scab that you don't particularly want to pick no um, so I, I didn't. I certainly didn't. Go, I'm, I'm sure that there were threads on Twitter of conversations between some people going, you know, "Why didn't he do this?" And why? And, and fine. I'm sure there are things I could. It's have easier done looking outside in, isn't it? Um, I think the the thing that was fu- the thing that I read that was funniest was I think it was in the Evening Standard, uh, and it was just that it was the bit, it was the bit about um, the Marwood episode or one of the Marwood episodes, and I, and I was described as as uh, dripping with passive. Uh, uh, aggression I think was uh, um, which is you know all of anything negative hurts isn't it of course but I remember reading it and sort of thinking really um, did I because you do I'm you know I'm hopefully I'm, I'm reasonably reflective well, actually well maybe I did yeah and then just, I, I, <laughs> and just, but once again it's I spoke to my, but I spoke to my wife about it so <laughs> she said what um, she said, yeah so Perce- you know it's, it's, per- stuff, it's, it's perception all it's all perception, perception. Is so you know, it's, on 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 the whole, the the bits that I saw that the reaction was positive, and that you know that positive reaction, and again, it's I mean it's hard it's hard thinking back to it without without getting slightly emotional about it. But I mean, I, I wrote something in the January, so the, immediately after the TV program had come out, and um, you know, I, I, I thanked, I wrote something which was thanking a lot of people in education who you know. The the reaction I really felt like I've been put back together again by the wow. by the social media. That's amazing. You know, and people reaching out to me that I absolutely no no clue. Mm. You know, I hadn't never met them, uh, offering support. You know, come and have a chat, uh, and and you know that that reaction was. But you're also paying that forward now. For example, I asked I'm you. Trying, two, I'm now I trying to pay two it day, forward. Yeah. But also for this, I asked you two days ago. I was like, oh, yeah. can you jump on a on a podcast? And literally, we managed to pull it together. So it's the fact that you. For me, it's about all about learning experiences. Yeah. What have we done? What have we overcome? Because a lot of the time, you learn more from your losses and yeah, learn totally. more from your challenges and obstacles yeah. than you do when when you actually win. Yeah. Um, so oh, no. right now, on, when I go and see your Twitter, LinkedIn, it seems like you're a director of a lot of different things, right? <laughs> Can you talk to me about what some of these things are? So you talk okay. about heads up and stuff. What, yeah. what, what are they and what's the, dis- what's, what's the difference between so them? So I set up, so when I finished, I set up in, Inspire Educate. Okay. Uh, and and it, uh, ostensibly that was, I wanted, to bring in, I wanted to bring a network of head teachers together or future head teachers together who felt a little bit like I did, that something wasn't quite right. There was something about the education system that we're operating in that wasn't quite right. And, and, you know, that was essentially a vehicle to grow a network, but also, you know, for me to do work with local schools, to go and do um, school improvement support, all of, all of that sort of sort of consultancy stuff. What's it called? Inspire? In, inspire Educate. Okay. Um, and that, you know, that was the vehicle. Out of that, then, after the TV program came out, sort of sprung this notion of heads up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were actually in the earlier, so I met with I met with Patrick Otley O'Connor, uh, and Glenn Drew coming on my podcast. Yeah. Great, uh, Patrick is brilliant. Uh, Drew Povey um, and Joanne Brown. The four of us met at Patrick's school in Liverpool, as okay. it was then his his school in Liverpool, North Liverpool Academy. Um, and this was sort of I think it was the February March time the following year, and we we were chatting about you know Drew's situation, which. You know, sort of similar experience. Patrick's sort of experience of headship through interim headship, 
um, Joanne's sort of experience of education more broadly, and we were talking about you know what had, what had happened with me, and then the, all of the contacts from different. We were sort of throwing ideas around, you know, perhaps we should do something for all of these heads, and that's mm. that was the start of what became Heads Up. We were we were going to call it in the early days Heads Will Roll, uh, which I quite liked as a sort of positive, but mm. also you know, uh, but Heads Up is better. Um, I like the branded by the way. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we, we called it Heads Up, and it, it kind of grew from there. So Heads Up started as a campaign on within Inspired Educate. Uh, I'm just about, I've got to look at sort of whether I launch it as a completely separate entity, as a, as a sort of possibly a charity or a not-for-profit. Because uh, there's no, we don't make any money out of it. It's, you know, the, the, we offer crisis support coaching to head teachers who are going through something similar. Um, and that's as many calls as people need. Do We do all of that. Just mm. phone us. There's no charge. Uh, we run network support sessions for the network. That's mm. it, you know, there's no charge. So you know, your point about paying it back that that's me doing doing the bit that I can do to stop this from happening to other people. Yeah. So we we essentially we offer individual support to heads who we call it heads in it's crisis. Really, it's, it's key, isn't it? Yeah, um, but we also then we want to bring enough of those people together. And the, and the aim was always, and COVID kind of scuppered it, but the aim was always basically to put 200 head teachers in a conference space who've been through and been pushed out of the system and then say to the DFE, really? Yeah. Can we afford for this to be happening? And don't get me wrong, there'll, there'll be people who this has happened to, you know, the, where due process has been filled, you know, the people who've stepped up to the headship job and, and it's not for them and they didn't do a very yeah, good, yeah. you know, that, that happens. But it, I don't think it is happening at the scale at which some of these people are being pushed out. Um, and and that's what we want to shine a spot on. It's mm. ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Um, so that that's what Heads Up does. So Heads Up is sort of sat within Inspired Educate. Uh, I'm co-exec lead at Whole Education. So uh, that's a national network of schools. Um, the schools that similarly, there's a lot of stuff that I do now in the same way with Hannah, you know, I, I look for stuff that really sort of uh, fuels my fire yeah. and, you know, is values aligned and, it, and is stuff that is exciting and interesting to me. Um, and the whole education network, you know, is a group of schools who are determined to do things differently and, and to move forward with education, but with the, with the emphasis being on whole education mm. um, and, and our practicing and our strategically put in place practices that will help that to happen. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I do. Um, some X. Amazing. Out of curiosity, what what do you think I do? You tell On me. the spot. On the spot. Uh, dreams to reality. Dreams to reality. Let me ask you a question, right? Because yep. you, you've got a huge amount of experience. When we, well, when I first done obviously a lot of stuff around Bristol, Gloucestershire, um, people would know me as say a motivational speaker, right? Yeah. Um, but what I do now is a lot more deeper than that. I go yep. to schools mainly focused around pupil premium, and I run in depth programs. We measure everything from hard data to soft data to yep. tick those boxes. What advice would you give me to continue growing and doing what I'm doing? So right now we are growing. Yeah. But I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to deliver impact and value. Yeah. Because I'm not about just turning up, doing a one-off session. Everyone feels great. Then they go home and it's all done. Because for me, all of a sudden, it, it just got boring in the end. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's a waste of money, I think, for a lot of schools. It's great sometimes, but it's like, where is the impact? Yeah. Um, but what advice would you give, say, me? I'm 28 now. So we've got a podcast. We've got different things going. But what advice would you give me to continue on my path? Or what, what should I do? I think... Well, simpl- simplistically, keep doing what you're doing. I lo- so I think I think there's something there's something about authenticity in what you do. Mm. Um, you know, and I've, I've done I've done since I've stopped being ahead. I've done all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and and some of it's dropped away, and and some of it I've really focused in and, and, and honed in on. Um, because I think it's about it's about being authentic. It's about your passion for what you believe. So you know, you clearly care really passionately about young people and outcomes mm. for young people, and not just outcomes through the narrow lens of GCSE results, mm, the bigger picture. but actually the bigger picture of what their life experiences are, mm. you know, what it means to be, and I hate the term, but you know, what does it mean to be a pupil premium child mm. or a, or a disadvantaged child? I, you know, I think I have an issue with stuff like that. I think pupil premium is a massive sanitization mm. of, of poverty. Let's call it out for what it is. Yeah, it's poverty. And well, we called it pupil premium because that makes it nice and palatable and we can, we can throw the term around and we know what we're talking about. Mm. 
Um, but actually, let's be realistic about what we're talking about. And so if that's the passion that you've got for it... What could, what could we do? What could we call it? What is there? I, I think I, I, you've got to give something a name, but I think let's make sure that we understand what that term actually means. Mm. So, you know, pupil premium, that's the funding that we give mm. for children who are coming from very, very disadvantaged backgrounds, a lot of whom are living in poverty. Yeah. So let's call it out for what it is. So let's not let's not distill it down to a reductive phrase that sanitizes it. Mm. So let's be clear about it. I love um, you know, and I think yeah, I'm really I'm really interested. I haven't got I just haven't got the capacity to do it, but yeah, I'm really interested in you know groups like yourself who are working with young people. Mm. You know, there's a it's, it feels like a moment in time, but I'd be really interested in a young person's movement around education mm. in this country in the same way that there was one around the environment with Greta Thunberg. Because mm. um, I think I think the dissatisfaction in our education system, I think children are feeling it. You know, I think kids are aware. And, and the, disfac- the disfac- dissatisfaction isn't with the school that they're at or the teachers. That, you know, so there's a lot to celebrate there. But I think it's dissatisfaction with this notion that, that the only reason they're there is to get GCSE grades. Mm. You know, we're talking about the first 16 years of children's lives. It's more than that, surely. Um, and I think an education, so you know, a whole education, an education that recognises everything that children do. It's a cycle though, man. It is the cycle, isn't it? Because if you start talking like that and then head teachers will be like, no, we only get judged off of this. I don't want to bring somebody in who's talking about this and that because then it's, it, it, you know. Yeah, totally. It's, but... But I think we we have how, to. How where how do you break that cycle? We have to we have to. So for me, I think you know there's a, there's a number of things that have happened in the last decade, fifteen years, all of which are, you know are reasonably um, toxic in terms mm. of the way that they come together. But you know to to break the cycle, I think we have to get back to asking some fundamental questions, and they're not they're not education questions, they're society ones. Yeah, I got you. What is education for? Because, you know, it, it has become defined by the outcomes that children get at the age of 16 and 18 and 11. But actually, what's it for? What do we want? What do I want for my kids? Mm. You know, I've got, I've got a 15-year-old daughter who's just gone into year 11. I've got a 5-year-old son who's just gone into year 1. There are 10 years between them difference. That's stressful, mate. <laughs> it's stressful. <laughs> yeah. You see the, the grey hairs. Uh, but my, so my 5-year-old is going to be the same position as my 15-year-old in the year 2030. What's the world going to look wow. like in 2030? Yeah. And what's, what's year 11 in secondary school going to look like in the year 2030? Mm. My fear is that it'll look pretty much like it does in the year 2020. Damn. I kind of think, I'm not sure that's right. Mm. And, 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 and I'm not. You know, this isn't mate. This you're push. You don't have to keep justifying yourself because I feel like you're really fighting a good fight. And one thing I think, what I like about you is you're not giving the answer. You're just giving the ideas. And what I mean by that, you're not saying I know what's right. I know what's wrong. You're chucking these ideas into a hat yeah. and let's say let's talk about it. Yeah, totally. And let's actually let's work it out. And I think that's what's so powerful about the leadership and, and what you're doing and what you're showing is actually because you are humble. You yeah. you, you you understand you. how it works. You're experienced, but you also you genuinely care for the teenagers and everybody involved in education. So you can't go wrong when yeah yeah. But it's it's about here. So so, I mean. so so a lot of um, a lot of leadership training in education has become very much about. And we, as a network, we talk about this with heads up a lot. But it's become very much about the technical aspects of leadership. Mm. And, and those technical skills are really really important. Yeah. But actually, there is another ingredient in there, and it's and it's this. Yeah. And wow. it's the stuff that fires your belly, and it's the you know people don't become heads to analyze data and, in, and improve that from 78%. Maybe some do. But my feeling is, and the reason why I set up Inspired Educate in the first place and what Heads Up has become, is my feeling is there are an awful lot of head teachers out there who want to be values-led, heart-led leaders with a vision and a strategy and a passion for young people and what those kids get. And they're battling the accountability system, which is telling them you need to do this, this, and this. 
and and that's fine. I, I get why they are not criticising accountability. Accountability there needs to is really be important. Some type of accountability. There has to be accountability. At the same time, there still needs but, to be a human aspect to it. But accountability should not lead the system. And and it's bizarre. Ofsted is bizarre. It is leading the education system, and it shouldn't do. Regulators and accountability systems are there as a check. Mm. Um, and my worry is that you know every time we have a new framework from Ofsted, every three or four years we get a new framework, and and. And that's become the sort of policy device for education. Yeah. What are Ofsted looking for? Right, that's what we need to do now. Hang on a minute. You know, what about the head teachers who are saying, actually, I'm going to do what's right for my school and my contacts and my community and my young people? Mm. Because actually, I've got an educational vision and I've got a strategy. Yeah. And I haven't just landed here, you know, from, from university. I've spent, I've spent 20 odd years building this experience. And I'm going to listen to what other people are saying. And I want Ofsted to come in and check me. Mm. What I don't want Ofsted to do is come in and tell me what I should be doing. Mm. Um, I, but that's what's happening. And I think that's on us. That's on heads. That's yeah. on head teachers to take that agenda back and to go, okay, this is our education system. What do we want for it? Yeah. Um, and that's... You know, that's happening. That happens in loads of different fora. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't happen. And loads of head teachers on Twitter and social media are really vocal about it. And that's absolutely fantastic. But we have to steal our profession back. Mm, this is about yeah. us taking control of it again and going, actually, what do we want it to be? And if we want it to be about outcomes and GCSE results and, and moving up the OECD league tables as a, as a consequence of that, great. My feeling is, for an awful lot of head teachers, that's not what they want it to be. You know, Laura McInerney wrote a great piece for The Guardian at the beginning of lockdown. And, and she talked about the prioritisation of outcomes for children over the last decade above anything else. And, and the piece that she wrote talked about really skillfully, as Laura, Laura does, she talked about actually what it's done is it reprioritised schools as centres of their community and the community aspect of schools and what schools do in their community that's part of that question. The bigger question, what is education for? Yeah. So what's your dream? Talk about dreams to reality. I think we've discussed a lot of the reality. What is your dream now, moving forward, James? The, how, so how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 48. 48. So you've still got quite a while left. I've still got a while to go. Yeah. <laughs> Dave just looked at me like, Jesus, you look older than that. Yeah, it's a beard, mate. It's a beard. It's the, it's like, Four, yeah, you haven't enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that, Dave. Uh, so <laughs> what's the dream? Um, the, 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 vision for, the vision for Heads Up is um, you know, really, really simply the vision for Heads Up is no other head teacher gets scapegoated. Mm. that's it okay so if you could sit down with any three people dead dead or alive but it can't be a family member <laughs> um, who would it be god what a question dead or alive um, I'd, I'd love I'd love to have, and this, this is relevant because it's recent but I'd love to have met Ken Robinson okay um, so, so rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace. I just, yeah, um, the opportunity to, you know, he was he was a very early inspiration for me. Sort of right back early in my education career. So that that would have been great to have the opportunity to meet him. Uh, Prince, oh, wish I could have met Prince. <laughs> Saw him live. Would have loved to have sat around the table with Prince yeah. uh, and, and just work out what's what's going on in that that genius head. Um, who would my third person be? I don't know, you put me on the spot now. I can't think of another one. There you have it. Okay, I just want to say a massive thank you for allowing it's us been to... It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Allowing us for us to come on a so Friday. What, what is it? You, you, you're still here at 10 past six on a Friday evening. Whoops, sorry. Guys, sorry no, for no, your no, family. No, no, not at all. Um, They'll be all right. I'm, I'm worried about you. No, no, we'll be fine. But all I, I will say is we'll put all your details. If you want to send us all the links and Great. everything, we'll push Fantastic. out and promote the best way we can. Right. But yeah, once again, James, thank you for being so open, being so honest. I genuinely so, do um, appreciate it. And I think it is really needed. And I can see that you've got a passion and you definitely got a purpose to drive you forward now, yeah. which is... Amazing. Yeah. 
With that said, guys, that is another episode of the Dreams to Reality podcast. You know it already, right? You've got two choices. You can either have excuses or you can have results, but you cannot have both. Make sure you do like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you on the next podcast.